If you've been following my Twitch, then you'll know that I've been undertaking a big project over the last couple of months. I've been busily playing every single Mega Drive game, selected by a whopping huge wheel that could choose anything from a Stone Cold classic to some utterly obscure Japanese baseball title. Usually it chooses the latter. Seriously, you wouldn't believe just how many sports games there are on the system. We're about halfway through this journey, and although I've already played quite a lot of Mega Drive games in my time, doing this has certainly helped me find games I'm not at all familiar with, some of which have been very pleasant surprises, and others… well, they're positively nightmarish. Let's just say that if I was to redo, once again, my very old list of the 20 worst Mega Drive games, there'd be a lot of changes already thanks to the Sega Mega Wheel. So I thought it might be fun to look at 10 games in this video, half of which are good, half of which are bad. Sort of a Mega Drive heaven and hell, if you will. But all of these games certainly aren't the usual ones you'll find on a Mega Drive related video. They aren't the ones that people usually shout about, nor are they the ones that tend to get all the scorn. You won't find any Dark Castles, Awesome Possums or Slaughter Sports here, and I'm not about to say that Musha and Twinkletail are hidden gems for the 10,000th time, good though they may be. Nah, mostly these are some quite deep cuts. And who knows, as I continue on this journey, I may well have cause to revisit this topic. Anyway, let's get started with a goodie, a licensed platformer directly from the very late stages of the machine. So this first game may not be obscure for too much longer. Literally just as I'm making this video, the announcement trailer has been released for a remaster of Gargoyles that will be available on all the modern platforms courtesy of Empty Clip Studios on October 19th, Keith David and all. I damn well hope it's a good one, because this title has always deserved a whole lot more respect put on its name. The original Gargoyles, released in late 1995, is one of the best games from the system's final chapters, and it was perhaps only that late release that really stopped it from getting the success that it absolutely deserved. Late period plus licensed game is not, after all, the most enticing of combinations. Even compared to some of the other later Mega Drive games that didn't do well initially but got praised later on, Gargoyles has remained somewhat in the shadows, at least until some bods at Disney decided that this game was worth a revival. Good on them, quite frankly. This is, of course, the game of the thoroughly well-remembered animated series where gargoyles that were once betrayed and petrified by humans over a thousand years ago are reanimated by an evil billionaire and thrust into the world of New York City circa 1994. You play as Goliath, leader of a clan of stone beasts, and the plot acts almost like a summary of the show's premise with a couple of levels set in the past before you end up in the Big Apple. If I were to sum up this platformer by comparing it with another one from the Disney vaults, I would say, what if you had the Lion King, but it was actually a well-balanced game and executed properly? There are quite a lot of similarities between the two games. Goliath has a lot of different moves in the striking department, similar in many ways to the adult Simba, including light and heavy strikes, throws and pouncers, and also a lot of the platforming is based on intricacy and jumping, with all sorts of climbing and swinging to be done. Again, you can find a lot of this in the more famous Lion King game. However, Gargoyles is a hell of a lot more fun. It's not as utterly unforgiving, and it's a much smoother experience. It will certainly get a bit tricky, but not in the kind of ludicrous and cheap way that Lion King does. Still, if there's one thing that's true of Disney's Mega Drive games, at least since the release of Aladdin in 1993, it's that they always look very pretty indeed, with some of the most fluid animation you'll find on the system, and Gargoyles is no exception to that. It might just be the best looking of the whole lot. All of these dark stages are just absolutely lovely to gawp at, and honestly the upcoming remasters got a lot of work to try and match it. The animation of Goliath and the various enemies is, of course, excellent. Once again we've got something that tries to be as close to the cartoon as the Mega Drive possibly can be, and it does a damn good job. And it sounds really good too. As far as fun facts go, this was one of the first works for Disney done by one Michael Giacchino, this alongside the fantastic Mickey Mania. And well, he's gone on to pretty decent things seeing as he is one of Disney's top composers and he's got an Oscar and everything. 
Some other familiar names are in the credits too, including programmer Chris Shrigley, who old microcomputer bods like me love for C64 games like the almighty Bounder. Gargoyles isn't all perfect, the controls can sometimes be a little bit irritating, especially when you're dealing with complex jumping sequences, and you do sometimes pass through things that you swear you should have grabbed on, but it's not such a major issue that you won't adjust to it. I think if only this had been released perhaps a few months earlier, this game may have got a lot more love. It generally reviewed fine, but the Mega Drive's time was coming to an end. Still, it is good to see Gargoyles making an imminent comeback, and hopefully the remaster will do it justice. It's only fitting that we move from a good licensed game to a really bad one, and, well seriously, people don't hate toys enough. It's the game based on the film that's not exactly the finest in the late great Robin Williams oeuvre, and it's published by Absolute Entertainment. Now there are publishers for the Sega, and 16-bits in general, who tend to get a bit of a kick in, usually folks like Acclaim, even if that might not exactly be fair. But if the game is published by Absolute, well in damn near every case you should run to the hills, because it's going to be an utterly festering pile of garbage that's begging to be let loose into the woods and shot. I don't believe that these guys ever managed to release anything decent in the 16-bit era. I'm sure someone might point to something or whatever, but I just don't see it and I've certainly never played it. Even if the main guys behind it, guys like Gary Kitchen and David Crane were industry legends, yeah, this didn't work out and in the 16-bit year some of the very worst games, including a lot of licensed guff, came from Absolute Entertainment. Yes, the name is quite unfortunate. Toys, even for them, is one of the worst. This is, much like the movie, a completely incomprehensible affair that only serves to waste your time. The majority of it consists of isometric-ish stages where you collect various toy weapons and use them to disable guard toys before taking out Lieutenant General Leland's security cameras, which you do with a water pistol. It doesn't sound like it should be too hard, but here's the trouble. There are many toys at your disposal, and they're mostly about as useful as a glass hammer. You can barely hit anything, even the more predictable ones like your default peanut gun are hard to judge, and then you've got the likes of the wind up duck and spinning top that just, well, they do what they want, and usually they don't want to actually bloody hit anything. Even taking out the most basic of enemy toys on the first level is an arduous affair, and I have to imagine that most everyone who played this never even made it past that. Not that they were missing an awful lot aside from one of the worst flying sequences ever committed to code, which is what you get at the end of the game. I think this is perhaps more famous as a terrible game on the old Super NES, but the Mega Drive version is possibly even worse. It also comes with some gratuitously offensive music, just to really ram it home. People talk a lot about the legendarily bad 16-bit games, but this one? Yeah, it's right down there. It could match all the heavyweight piles of cack blow for blow. One of the worst licensed games there has ever been. How's about a relaxing bit of puzzling? Usually if a game involves Mahjong tiles it means one of two things, either you're going to be playing a relaxing bit of solitaire, or you're going to be gawping at a highly competitive spot of hot gambling action, most likely all in Japanese too. While anyone who's tried to make their way through a whole console's library is probably familiar with sifting through a ton of Mahjong titles, Shikinjo does something a little different with all the various characters and bamboos or whatnot, with the result being a pretty decent puzzle game that's best described as a combination of Solitaire and Sokoban, or Shove It. There's a couple of Shikinjo games. As you might expect, this title started its life on Japanese computers like the PC-88 and 98, and it was then ported to the Mega Drive and Game Gear in 1991 by Sunsoft, with other versions coming to the NES and Game Boy, and even later versions of it making their way to the PS1 and Saturn. The aim of the game is much the same as in Shove It. You have to push blocks around in order to get to the door and exit the single screen level. 
Simple enough, but Shikinjo changes fins up by adding solitaire walls. If you push a tile next to one that matches it, both of them will disappear. There are also blocker tiles that cannot be moved. Usually these are either wind and dragon tiles, or they're face down. If you push any of the other tiles next to them, then that will also become a dead tile, even if you're also pushing it next to a matching one. So yeah, it's a bit different from the norm, and as someone who generally doesn't mind this block pushing sort of game, I get a kick out of that. As far as puzzle games go, this has most of what I appreciate. I can't stand it if puzzlers have arcade sensibilities such as lives or a timer when they aren't needed, but happily Shikinjo allows you to play at your own pace, restarting as many times as you want and even taking steps backwards if you realise quickly that you've screwed up. And you'll need the time. It's not too long before this game starts to boil your brain, presenting all these different paths you can possibly take, having to try and set out moves way in advance and so on. It gets very challenging indeed, but with that comes the satisfaction of actually working something out and being overjoyed when it actually works. The technical aspects are all what you would expect. The graphics are thoroughly functional, although you don't usually play these games for visual fireworks, do you? If you want, you can change the default theme to a few others, and you can also change the music at your leisure. Generally, the music is absolutely fine. There are a couple of different modes from what I can see. There's a special set of levels that appear to be designed for absolute experts only, the ability to create levels of your own, and the most intriguing bit. This game was actually compatible with the Mega Modem. It appears that the main functionality of the modem here was being able to transfer your custom stages to other players, which makes a lot of sense. Obviously it's not something you're going to be able to do today, I'm afraid, but this appears to be the only version of the game that included this feature. Seeing as it's a puzzle game that never left Japan, Shikinjo isn't exactly well known. There's very little English info about it at all online, but if you enjoy matching wits with a board full of tiles and pushing things around then, I highly recommend giving it a whirl. Got a Mega Drive? Want some pinball? You've got a few options. Of course you've got Dragon's Fury, or you know, Devil Crush, and Psycho Pinball, both of whom fight it out for the top spot pretty far away from everything else. There's the more controversial likes of Crewball, and of course Sonic Spinball, lousy games like Dino Land, and then… well, all the way down at the bottom you've probably got this one, Virtual Pinball, by Electronic Arts no less but I'm afraid it's most certainly one of the weaker games that they released for the system, and most definitely one of the least known nowadays. So Virtual Pinball is in many ways a follow-up to a much older game, Bill Budger's Pinball Construction Set, all the way from 1983. That game certainly had an audience back then, hell, it inspired Will Wright's SimCity, but this follows the same path, allowing players to construct their own tables, while also providing a few examples for inspiration. Unfortunately, well, graphics aside, not a whole lot has really changed in the decade that passed between this and the original. There's not too much you can really do as far as making tables go aside from putting down flippers, bumpers, tracks and what have you, so you only end up with something that's kind of simplistic for the time period. This in itself might not be too much of an issue if you're just happy screwing around in a pinball sandbox, but the actual quality of the pinball game is just nasty. The ready-made tables are these awful double-wide messes with nothing whatsoever to them, a thoroughly cohesive jumble of nonsense, complete with some rather unfortunate music and sound effects. Talking about ball physics and the like is, uh, yeah, that's not going to be pretty, I'm afraid. One of the themes is based on the old magazine GamePro, mind you, and hey, it looks like they gave it a pretty decent score. Hopefully that was worth it. This game, more than anything else, is a victim of old father time. For a start, what was once revolutionary in 1983 on computers isn't going to be quite as impressive a decade later here on the Mega Drive, especially when compared to the likes of Psycho Pinball. Back when this was released, there was a certain niche for this game, a context through which it could be appreciated, in that there are certainly people interested in screwing around and making a table of their own, rather than just playing pre-made ones. And hey, say if there was a copy of this in a rental store or whatever, it could be fun to see what other people had made, perhaps make something yourself that could be passed on, or be a right bad bastard and delete all the tables that these random strangers had slaved over. 
Sadly, it's kind of tricky to recreate those sorts of experiences nowadays, and something like Virtual Pinball just isn't able to hold up that well over the years, unfortunately. <laughs> While we're on games that are pretty niche, here's something else that could only be found in Japan. Metal Fans. This is a game that's more of a curiosity than something that's flat out good, but I did want to bring it up because it's just so weird. This one has an odd history. One of the few games released by Victor Musical Industries, the Japanese counterparts to JVC, it was initially going to be fully released by Sega and developed in-house. However, well, by all accounts, things didn't go to plan, the game was hugely delayed because Sega was so unhappy with it, and it eventually just dribbled out to virtually no audience in late 1993, despite being completed 18 months prior. That's one theory at least. It was also tipped to be a Sega CD game at one point, perhaps even something that could have been used to push JVC's Wonder Mega. But for whatever reason, this did not happen. It's safe to say that the development of this game was fraught, but the end result is certainly odd. This is a racing game, but with a twist. You set up a team of drivers, and you go against opposing teams in something that's kind of like a post-apocalyptic roller derby, where you use weapons and boosts to score points and wreck the opponent's cars. The cars race automatically without your assistance, and you can switch from car to car, although you don't have to manually control anything if you don't want to. This gameplay is odd enough, although the characters you can choose from are even stranger. They're all based around popular musicians and other people from pop culture. Do you fancy putting together a team consisting of Johnny Rotten, David Bowie, Robert Smith and Morrissey? What about Andy Warhol and Blixer Bargeld mixed with Chris Cross? If you ever wanted to do such things well, <laughs> now's your chance. Yeah, that's a bit odd. The game itself is… well, there's not a whole lot to it really. A few weapons, the chance to upgrade your cars and the AI of your drivers between races, a weird card game that's totally out of place. But then, saying that a card game is weird doesn't make much sense when you've got Angus Young, Madonna and the Beastie Boys taking lumps out of each other on the track, does it? It is a somewhat average game, but it might just be the most out there one on the whole system. And that at least deserves attention. It's time to relax after that intense car combat experience, so how's about a bit of golf? Plenty of good options here, but naturally I'm going for a game I've discovered that's one of the worst sports sims on the whole Mega Drive, Chi Chi's Pro Challenge Golf. In Japan this was the sequel to a game called Top Pro Golf, but when this was inexplicably localised to America, it got the licence for one of the sport's most popular characters, Chi Chi Rodriguez, a Puerto Rican golfer who was always quick with a witty line, and whenever he got a birdie he used to twirl his club around and sheaf it like he was Errol Flynn with a putter. You at least get to see that in the intro, which is probably the best part of the whole thing. For some folks, the idea of a golf game in general may be somewhat objectionable, but even for those, it surely doesn't take much to look at something like, say, PGA Tour Golf 2 right here, and then look at this and see the humongous sand traps worth of difference between them. Right from the moment you pick between Chi Chi and a collection of random faces, you see that the play takes place on a postage stamp on a course that can be either USA or Japan, although whichever one you choose it will be one of the most barren and featureless courses you've ever seen, comparable only to Royal Birkdale Championship Golf on the ZX Spectrum. And at least that course had a proper name. The actual golf is done through power bars, and you would think that would be difficult to mess up. But this manages it. The bar is all over the shop, and it's so hard to actually hit a shot how you want it. You'll either grotesquely underhit it or slam it into the back of beyond. The approach to the green is terrible enough, but the real nightmare happens when you get onto the bloody dance floor. There is no guidance at all when it comes to the green, and no way to read it like an actual golfer would. This is where you really have fun with the power bar. If the ball doesn't just literally die into the hole, it'll probably jump or lip out and go 20 feet away, and you won't have a clue what you did wrong. It's like the hole has a force field around it. 
This absolute hair tear in misery is repeated on every hole until the game is turned off and chucked into the nearest water hazard, and that probably won't take long. Trust me, while this may look like any old generic and boring golf game, it hides a sheer level of incompetence that puts it down as one of the worst attempts at recreating a sport that I've seen in my entire life. Up next, we're logging on to the Sega Meganet. Usually there's not an awful lot to say about the downloadable games on this service that were available through the Sega Game to Shokan, or Sega Game Library. In the West we did get two games that had their origins on the Toshikan, those being the Dungeon Crawler Fatal Labyrinth and the port of the classic Sega arcade game Flicky. Other than that there's Sonic Eraser, which is certainly one of the most obscure entries in the Blue Bullets canon, a cut down and long lost version of Columns, a whole load of text adventures related to the characters from Phantasy Star 2, another world arcade in the shape of Teddy Boy Blues, and a cachet of generally simple and honestly not very good titles. However, here's one game from the Toshikan that I enjoy a lot, Awog Hero in the Sky. As far as a simple little title goes, this one's actually got some decent fins going for it. AWOG is a thrust type game. You make your way through mazy levels, trying to find the keys to open the gate, usually there's three of them. Naturally it's not going to be all the way simple, with all sorts of objects in your way, whether it's blobs, sword carrying monsters, or thousands of spikes. Awog has a few things that can help him deal with these threats. He has a dash attack that's useful against his opponents, and if he's really in a pinch he's got a big whirlwind special move, which can be used at the cost of a couple of blocks of energy. For anything that can't just be headbutted or awoged out of the way, Awog has to use his regular movement. Blobs or spiky balls are best cleared by using the wind, thrusting next to them and moving them out of the way, which is a weird little concept but kind of fun once you make sense of it. Obviously this isn't exactly a long game, being that it's on the Toshikan, there's only 10 rounds in fact, so it's not really something you could have made a full on cartridge release of unless it was significantly expanded, but what's here is a decent little distraction, and definitely better than the likes of, I don't know, Riddle Wired, Hyper Marbles and 16T. This did get a sort of physical release as part of the Mega CD's Game No Kanzame or Game Can collections of Toshikan titles, but of course these were Japan only. Definitely worth firing this up on whatever you can, whether it's a flashcart, a mister, Kega Fusion or that 25 year old copy of Genesis you've still got lying around for some reason. <laughs> We're going back to the licensed game world, this time for a game that never left Japan, Mamona Hunter Yoko Dai 7 Keisho. This is a platformer released in 1991 by Masaya and it ties in with the Devil Hunter Yoko anime TV series. Apparently it's some sort of thing where a magic girl slays demons and also goes to school and stuff like that. Let's be honest, this is the sort of thing that people who can't stand anime think that all anime consists of, isn't it? Regardless of that, I'm always curious when I find a platformer I'm not aware of when it comes up on the Mega Wheel. After all, the Japan only games will usually be RPGs or strategy games that, alas, I can't exactly make head nor tail of because I don't know the language. But this one, yeah, it's really quite terrible. Perhaps not the worst of the five bad games we're looking at here, but still something of an unappealing mess. If you're not familiar with the anime that this comes from, then a quick look at this title will probably remind you of something else, that being Telenet's Phallus, another series where a girl wavers around a big sword and takes out demons and other beasts with it. Mamona Hunter Yoko does feature less in the way of nonsensical plot between levels, but generally as a game it plays a lot worse. The main issue really is the jumping, which ends up being something of a nightmare. You're probably going to die an awful lot due to irritating leaps of faith, or our hero not exactly doing the jump you'd hoped she would do because it just doesn't feel right. 
The game is pretty simple when it comes to attacks and the like. You get a basic sword swing as well as a shield that you can call up and throw at enemies, but the various creepy crawlies and sinister beings are honestly the least of your problems. When this game tries to get really intricate and you're having to deal with things like the wind and twisting paths while wrestling with the horrendous jumping, yeah, good luck. On the whole, this game may not have been too bad if it wasn't for it completely fouling itself when it comes to, well, the most important part of a platform game. A rather unfortunate affair, and there's not a whole lot in the way of nice looking aesthetics to help things along, unless you really fancy playing a Valis-esque game that's hiding under some complete duffel of an anime license. We have one more good and one more bad game to go, and our final goodie is another strange one. It's a western title, and one that I very rarely hear being mentioned anywhere, yet I've always been curious about it. Generations Lost is a 1994 platformer released by Time Warner and developed by a short-lived studio called Pacific Softscape. This was, in fact, their only game, although they later did a lot of work on the BIOS and design of the Sega Channel. The majority of the Pacific Softscape team had previously worked on the Mega Drive's first X-Men game, and Generations Lost was initially supposed to be a sequel to that centred around Cyclops. However, when Sega decided to go to another studio for the X-Men sequel, designer Bruce Straley and the rest of Softscape decided to turn it into an original game. This origin story does make a lot of sense. There's quite a lot of similarities between this game and the first X-Men title, although I would say that Generations Lost ends up being a lot better. The plot here involves a man named Manobe who wishes to find out the history of his tribe and is sent on a quest to discover their origins by a tribal elder named Giza. If you're British, this name is going to be rather funny. It's all quite Edgar Rice Burroughs-ish at first, everything's smacking a little bit of John Carter and Tarzan as you go through a fantastical jungle, although this setting will change drastically as the game goes along and the plot does have a decent bit of depth to it. As a game, Generations Lost fits into the cinematic platformer genre. In fact, I wonder if people have just seen screenshots of it and dismissed it as a poor man's flashback, although this wouldn't be very fair. Generations Lost is a bit more linear than something like Delphine's game after all, and it doesn't really feature the same sort of item-based puzzling. This is more about negotiating your way through traps and occasionally powering up the tools at your disposal, primarily consisting of an ERAD grappling hook that can hook onto platforms and occasionally be used to swing around all over the place. Other challenges come in the shape of quite well-executed hacking minigames and triggering lots of switches, and you've also got limited quantities of projectile weapons and shields to help you out in a pinch. As far as moving about goes, you can also jump and roll around. Not as many moves as in something like Flashback, but enough to be getting on with. The game is most certainly an atmospheric one, and it's very nice indeed to look at. While, much like X-Men, it's not the smoothest mover out there, it's certainly a game that grabbed me quite quickly, helped along by a plot that's actually somewhat intriguing. Does it manage to hold attention for the duration? Mm, there's no denying that it has a few rough spots. There's a lot of the game that does feel bare and unpopulated, and as good looking as the game appears, it can feel kind of empty from time to time. I suppose that's a part of the design, mind you. The levels can also be a little cheeky, with a fair few annoying leaps of faith and cheap hits from traps that you can't see before jumping down, and the collision detection can also be a little shaky. It's an odd creature. It does appear to use the same base as the original X-Men game, so Pacific Softscape were trying to create a platformer that felt more cinematic, using a base that wasn't necessarily designed for that. I can't imagine they had access to the same sort of tools that a studio like Delphine had, for example. In the end, they make a pretty decent fist of it, although it does come with some issues. Generally, it's a decent title and worth having a look at, although it is surprising to see that most magazines utterly scorched it at the time, lambasting it for its unoriginality and inferiority to the likes of Flashback and Blackthorn. But if you like those games and you want another one in the same sort of style, you might want to give Generations Lost a go. Again, this one almost never gets mentioned, but it's perhaps deserving of a little bit more attention. Our 
Our final bad game is a good old fashioned shoot 'em up. Indeed, it's one of the first side scrolling shooters on the system, coming at you all the way from 1989. And it stinks royally. Unfortunately, the job of creating this horizontal shmup fell to Micronet, the legendary studio that would go on to produce golden gems such as Heavy Nova and the Warrior of Rome series, both of which I could easily be talking about here instead of Curse. A theme that tends to run through a lot of Micronet's games is that they can often be visually and orally decent with some quite fine touches, such as the excellent cinematic intro for the otherwise diabolical Heavy Nova. But when it comes to playing the games, technically they fall off a cliff with their games being juddering, choppy messes that seemingly move at half the speed they're supposed to, and such is the case here with Curse. Even if this was released in 1989, this is still a game that makes the Mega Drive look like a total weakling. The game being so early isn't much of an excuse considering that the likes of Thunder Force 2 came out during the same year, really. Just why on earth is it so choppy? It feels unoptimised and unfinished even, and that certainly doesn't help the game's playability. This choppiness is one thing, but graphically, the game's a bloody mess. Your biggest enemy in the game is all the things that look like background objects to the point where you can even shoot through them, but then you try and go past them and die because they're actually obstacles. While some of the stages, particularly level 2, are just hideous to look at, the sort that make your eyes start bleeding out. Curse may seem like a tricky game at first, you don't get any continues and there are no checkpoints in the stages, but it's not all that tough. It's not too hard to get fully powered up and become a wall of death, just holding the fire button down and destroying everything immediately, ideally with the wide shot or V laser weapons. You also get options and homing missiles at your disposal, and your ship has a shield meaning that you're able to take a couple of regular shots, there's usually lots of refills flying about. Indeed, the first four levels are kind of a mind-numbing cakewalk. It's only when you get to the last stage inside the mother spaceship when you finally start to meet something that's a bit of a challenge, and by that point it's kind of too late. The final boss battle with mother itself is also a toughie. She's probably the best looking thing in the game too, but yeah, it doesn't exactly pull the game back from the abyss. I will say, at least, that the music in the game is generally very good, but that doesn't make up for anything else. Curse was slated for a release outside of Japan in 1990, even advertised and reviewed in some magazines, but at the 11th hour, publishers in TV made the decision to pull it. This was probably the right one. I mean, this is the time when Sega's PR was all about bringing the arcade experience home. Well, one look at this game and how it moves kind of throws a load of cold water over that, I'm afraid. It is one of the first shooters on the system, but it's also one of the worst. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look at a bunch of old Sega games. Perhaps you've found something here that looks appealing to you, or that you're not familiar with. It's certainly been fun, and there may well be more videos in this vein as I continue to make my way through the Mega Drive's library. Once again, you can follow that over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash kim underscore justice, which will be linked in the description. But until the next time, bye for now.